Good morning and good evening, as applicable. My name is Whitney Aaron Basil, and on behalf of the entire Theorizing the Web Organizing Committee, I'd like to welcome you today to this episode of Theorizing the Web Presents, Diminishing Returns. Theorizing the Web Presents is our series of talks about technology and society. New episodes will stream on selected Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll also announce some special events later this fall. If you'd like to discuss today's episode in real time, we invite you to join us in the TTW Discord. You can find the Discord back channel by following the link in the description of this YouTube video or on our website, theorizingtheweb.org. We will also be taking Q&A questions from the Discord. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the production team at Museum of the Moving Image, without whom Theorizing the Web Presents truly would not be possible. I'd also like to thank my fellow organizing committee members, as well as all three of today's panelists. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for watching and participating. If you'd like today's talk and want to see more, please consider making a donation to both Museum of the Moving Image and Theorizing the Web. Each donation helps us to produce content like this, and we're so glad that we can do this with you. And with that, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. Brittany Gill. Brittany Gill is an audiobook producer, co-host of the podcast Iron Weeds, producer of the audio edition of Real Life Magazine. Her writing has appeared in Real Life, Refinery29, Cyborgology, and The New Inquiry. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Whitney, and thanks every thanks to everyone who's tuning in for this episode of Theorizing the Web Presents Diminishing Returns. We're going to take a look today at how wealth is created in digital economies and discuss who profits and who doesn't. Our first speaker uses the case study of a band's prank album to explore how Spotify can help us rethink forms of wealth creation in the context of commodified digital assets. And our second, speaker, our second speaker is going to shift our attention to those at the very bottom of the digital production chain and how these workers are largely hidden and poorly paid despite the importance of their labor. So with that, <clears throat> I'll introduce our first speaker, Rob Arcand, whose presentation is titled Ambient Accumulation Towards a Political Economy of the Stream. Rob is a writer, editor, and web developer based in Brooklyn. His work focuses on the relationship between digital platforms and the arts. Uh, he's recently completed an MA in Computational Media, Arts, and Cultures at Duke University. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Rob. Hey, Brittany, thanks so much. Um, I am going to get set up with my slides and get started. Okay. So yeah, like Brittany said, um, my name is Rob Arcand. I'm a freelance writer, editor, and web developer here in New York. <clears throat> I worked for Spin Magazine for a number of years, and um, I've covered popular music, music technology, and the music industry for quite a while now. Um, so I want to kind of start by talking about uh, an album that came out in 2014, and uh, one that really got me thinking about how monetization works on Spotify. Often there's this precise moment in which the playback of each digital media file um, is converted into income for content creators. And I wanna think through how digital platforms monetize uh, recorded media and what this sort of says about the dynamics of global capitalism um, in this kind of contemporary moment. Uh, so in uh, March, 2014, the Michigan funk band Wolfpack uh, uploaded something strange to the audio streaming service Spotify. Tucked between releases from some of the music industry's biggest celebrities, the band's first full-length album looked pretty ordinary on the surface with the kind of clumsy cover art that plagues many groups just starting out. You can see kind of an image of it here and what Spotify looked like in 2014. Um, anyone who actually tried to press play on the album noticed something that was off. Uh, fumbling with their volume dial and internet connection, uh, listeners likely noticed that despite their best efforts, not a single sound was ever emitted from their speakers. The album was completely silent. Um, as silly as it might seem on the surface, Sleepify was more than just a conceptual joke. Released as a promotional gesture to help the band fund a free nationwide tour, uh, the album came with explicit instructions for fans to stream its 10 tracks while they slept, uh, hence the name Sleepify, um, which earned them five tenths of a, uh, of a cent per single song and uh, five cents per full listen to the 10 track album. 
Um, since each stream is quantified after a 30 second period uh, in the Spotify interface, uh, where the interface increments each track's play count in its database and initiates a claim to pay the artist at the end of the coming month, um, the band made a point to make each track just slightly longer than 30 seconds um, in an effort to kind of maximize the income they would receive from Spotify. Uh, they pr put this uh, promotional video up on YouTube to kind of promote the campaign. Um, I don't want to play it right now, but one of the kind of more interesting quotes that, or quotes that I found interesting was, uh, you know, never before in the history of music has it been so easy to support a band's tour. This is the band leader, Jack Stratton. Um, all you need to do is make your sleep productive. So we're, we're witnessing a kind of uh, fascinating shift from music that was commodified as uh, discrete commodities, uh, vinyl records, cassette tapes, CDs, digital downloads to a sort of time-based durational thing that could theoretically be played while a, uh, a listener slept with, without really uh, any kind of into, uh, <clears throat> attention necessary. Uh, so while the group ultimately earned about $20,000 for their tour before Spotify went on to ban the practice uh, a couple months later, um, claim, the, Spotify claimed that it violated their privacy policy, um, their content policy, um, but the, the gesture itself raises numerous questions about the ways that digital platforms actually commodify digital audio at the level of duration. Um, once bound by the commodity status of compact discs, cassette tapes, vinyl records, et cetera, um, digital media offers unique affordances that problematize its position as a stable commodity. Um, what the media and communication scholar uh, cited on my slides, Jeremy Wade Morris, has termed the digital music commodity. Um, it's a convenient point of entry into questions that sort of about this complicated tension between, you know, do digital files, are, are they still commodified? Um, but I, it, I think it kind of falls short of uh, the complexity that a lot of what's going on with a service like Spotify. Um, and it asks a lot of really big questions about where exactly music is still commodified. And is this currently, is this still relevant? Are these questions still relevant to how we interact with music today? Um, if music is no longer bought and sold as finite digital files can still be considered a commodity um, or is the entire streaming platform with both ad supported and subscription based options uh, is that now the commodity instead uh, since the media object still retains a functional use value for users eager to you know enjoy their favorite music on this service um, does the consumer now represent a kind of commodity to advertisers who regularly negotiate deals with streaming platforms to reach their users um, this is kind of idiom and discussions of social media that, you know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Um, and I, I do think there's some truth to that, but it's, it doesn't really uh, extend beyond that idiom to encompass a, a sort of thorough form of critique. Um, so how can we begin to think about digital platforms like YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Tidal, Pandora, Apple Music, Amazon, and others um, that pay musicians based on temporal duration not the sale of any isolated commodity. Um, so I want to use this space today to explore the cultural and economic implications of this shift uh, with a focus on streaming as it can be generalized to encompass both audio and video. Uh, subjected to such conditions of commodification in which payment is determined by these kind of often arbitrary temporal thresholds monitored by digital interfaces, uh, indexed in databases and uh, calculated for payout at the end of a month generally that's how it works on Spotify. Um, I'd argue that you know the two formats digital audio and digital video are occupying a, an increasingly similar position uh, on digital platforms and there's a rhetor certain uh, rhetorical value in this kind of generalization. Um, for creators on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music and others, um, the temporal duration of each piece of recorded media becomes an important site of consideration as the means by which creators make money. Um, in some ways, time itself now plays an essential role in this process of commodification, um, serving a central function in the space between creators and the digital platforms they rely on for payment. So I, I want to use this term ambient accumulation uh, to account for this shift with time now playing a major role in the commodification of recorded media. Um, in a single word, ambient captures something implicit about the temporal operation of media recordings, um, which countless artists have you know, used to create events. Um, so uh, Brian Eno, you know, famously used the term ambient music to describe, you know, music that's uh, in 
in the liner notes to his album Ambient One, uh, Music for Airports, he is, that's kind of sort of the place where he first defined ambient music and he called it, you know, music that's as ignorable as it is interesting. Um, he was sort of looking back at the history of Muzak, um, the, which was created by the Muzak Corporation um, and distinguished his own work as ambient in contrast to what could be described as background music used in, you know, shopping malls and, and composed with that in mind. Um, but his Wolfpack show with Sleepify, interesting, can encompass a near infinite variety of artistic practices, um, including those that don't necessarily fit within an act's artistic practice at all. I mean, the, the music that Wolfpack uh, generally make is, you know, kind of funk music, uh, dance music. Um, and this is, this was kind of just like a promotional campaign to make money. Um, so uh, yeah, ambient accumulation also suggests a certain continuity with the loose discipline known as ambient computing um, in the same way that ambient computing technologies um, are used to monitor aspects of their surrounding environment. Uh, ambient accumulation relies on a shift away from discrete commodities toward efforts to monitor both recorded media objects and user behavior um, to record this in data and make it, make it productive within the kind of broad apparatus of the digital platform, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, et cetera. Um, in his book, The Message is Murder, Substrates of Computational Capital, um, the media theorist Jonathan Beller notes that this information, this data gleaned from the digital file, um, emerges in the footprint of the value form, providing an actionable correlate for the logic of financialization. This footprint mirrors a broader shift to financialization at the scale of the digital platform where executives you know, can balance budgets against the potentially boundless horizontal expansion of the music streaming market. Um, that's a quote from Spotify Teardown uh, and shift their ambitions to align with the ebb and flow of global capital. So um, a lot of this kind of came about because organizations didn't really have ways to monetize uh, digital media and the play count became a kind of actionable correlate uh, in the absence of, you know, wanting to create an ad supported mechanism for payout that didn't necessarily rely on, uh, yeah, digital sales. Um, so I kind of want to look at two bodies of literature bound up in these questions as they pertain to recorded media objects and the transformations that they face in the current moment. Um, first, the tradition of German media theory, um, as articulated by scholars like Bridget Kittler and Wolfgang Ernst, uh, which offers a useful perspective on technological objects as they're preceded by human interpretation. Um, the school's best known earliest scholar, Friedrich Kittler, uh, makes a point to reject the interpretive tendencies of literary study and cultural studies, uh, et cetera, to instead focus on what he calls the technological a priori, um, the discursive space of possibility that precedes an object's use by humans. Uh, this understanding has roots in studies of archives uh, where the printed word exists as a kind of autonomous entity in and of itself before being subjected to models of interpretation in the process of historical research and discourse at all. Um, in, his, in the way he takes this up, Wolfgang er Ernst aims to update this approach uh, for studies of digital archives in which internet protocols introduce a dimension of time criticality to even the simplest web searches. Um, his books, Digital Memory in the Archive, Sonic Time Machines and chronic, Chronopoetics uh, explore an understanding of sound and rhythm as they precede human interpretation, a kind of infrastructural scaffolding hidden beneath uh, the many computational operations that uh, sort of result in digital media being played. Um, he writes in Digital Media in the Archive, uh, digital archeology span even operates below the sensual threshold of sight and sound, uh, a level that is not directly accessible to human senses because of its sheer electronic and calculating speed. Um, so while certainly useful, uh, these perspectives don't really account for digital platforms and their relationships with capital. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly necessary to situate this kind of media theoretical apparatus approach uh, within the other, within another uh, materialist tradition that comes out of Germany, um, namely that of Karl Marx and critical political economy, um, drawing on a Marxist understanding of capitalist accumulation as described in volume one of Capital as well as <clears throat> the Marxist geographer David Harvey's work on flexible accumulation as articulated in his book, The Condition of Postmodernity, uh, we can observe a certain continuity in the last few decades of capitalism's development regarding financialization. Um, capitalism's need for constant growth uh, 
leaves financiers uh, constantly seeking out new sites of expansion, uh, which is both Marx and Harvey articulate, um, are often drawn along spatial and temporal lines. Uh, Harvey uses the term space time time-space compression um, to describe the ways that advances in shipping and information technologies have redrawn the globe in accordance with faster production schedules. And as I see it, these changes have now woven their way into the very frame of the digital platform, uh, tightening the grip on the precise mechanics of aesthetic experience uh, with a variety of observable effects for artists, for fans, uh, for users of any sort um, on digital platforms. So, um, but of course, you know, none of this is without precedent. Uh, performance royalties and mechanical royalties in the music industry have long been calculated uh, based on available data from organizational bodies like um, the ASCAP, the American Society of Composer Composers, Authors and Publishers, um, BMI, Broadcast Music Inc. And SESAC, the Society of European Stage Authors and Composers, um, trade unions in the television and film industries have long negotiated what are called uh, residuals, which are payments based on series syndications, reruns, um, physical releases on VHS and DVD, DVDs, um, which now in many ways extend to digital streaming services like Hulu and Spot, uh, Hulu and Netflix. Um, these are kind of uh, his. They have a very different tradition from that uh, as this has a, exists in uh, music and it grows out of kind of union negotiations um, between major studios and unions like uh, the Writers Guild of America, the Directors Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild. Um, these kind of took off in the 1950s and continue today uh, to be a huge part, play a huge role in, in this sort of negotiation. Um, so as we can see, uh, you know, in the example of Sleepify, uh, these logistical practices for payment have become embedded within the same digital platforms responsible for playback, uh, turning what were once separate processes bound up with entire industries into technological operations monitored by a handful of monolithic platforms. Um, we can view these practices as a technological correlate uh, to the scalar logic of financialization um, using temporal thresholds located within media playback in place of what once meant the sale of individual commodities. That concludes my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Rob. That was really interesting. Um, I've always, well, we'll I'll save this for the Q&A, but... Um, <laughs> So our next speaker I'm going to invite up is Alif Ibrahim. Uh, his presentation today is titled Software Scanners and Sharecroppers on the Boundaries of Digital Labor. Alif is a writer and artist from Indonesia, and his work on art, technology, and culture has recently appeared on It's Nice That, as well as in Real Life Magazine. So with that, take it away, Alif. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just give me a second. So yeah, as uh, Brittany said, my name is Alif Ibrahim. I'm a writer and artist based in Jakarta. Uh, I'd just like to thank Theorizing the Web and the Museum of Moving Image for this opportunity to share my research titled Software Scanners and Sharecroppers on the Boundaries of Digital Labor. Um, so today I'd like to talk about how software operates. So not as a piece of code that runs, and not even on an interfacial level, but how software is imbued with vitality. And by vitality, I mean a coming to life, a becoming not by birth, but by a network of citations suspended like an Android, bursting with mismatched cables. Before I moved back to Jakarta, I took a practical methods class for my MA that had us look at practical methods of engaging with technology. So to defamiliarize ourselves with technology, we plugged in four mouses into the same computer, uploaded files into a server through the command line and examined database structures, so things like that. Now, as a class, our attention was drawn towards generative adversarial nets, the machine learning algorithm behind deep fakes that was supposed to destroy democracy and truth, right? This type of AI was captivating because it was dangerous. It was new and it was loaded to the brim with hype. One afternoon, I saw a billboard ad for an AI powered toothbrush shown here, Genius X by Oral B. This is AI at its most banal, a toothbrush that learns how you brush your teeth. So we engage with software in different ways. 
though they may share the same technology. With some exceptions, this explosion in machine learning requires data. There, there is today a data labeling economy that is set to become a billion dollar industry in three years. So one question that this brings us to is, what is software? Is it just the code? Is it the instructions that the code represents? Is it always digital? Were you surprised that the data labeling economy exists? The, quick, the key question I'm focusing on is this. What is the relation between the autonomy of software and its material preconditions? That is, how does software and technology that's considered smart become privileged over other material and labor factors that are required for the software to exist? For Lucy Suchman, the vitality of technical artifacts comes about from obfuscating the material conditions of their emergence by what theorist Wendy Chun calls the privileging of code. That is, software as code can only be perceived as cutting edge, high tech, revolutionary, genius, autonomous if it has been severed from its building blocks. For the smart machine to save labor and operate obediently to leave users unsurprised, the labor needed to create the machine needs to be erased. Note the affinity of this description to gendered domestic service. This is an artwork that I made last year that illustrates this idea. In an enchanted or mystical technology, the user doesn't just interact with the software directly. The software is contextualized through a network of citation, user guides, onboarding, press releases, FAQs, advertisements, brochures, and so on and so on. The smoothness of our experience in new media, cinematic in effect, is enabled by hours of labor that seems to be hidden. But by relying on the concept of hidden, with this dependence on a visual metaphor, this implies that visibility would be its contrapoint. But often, the workers are acknowledged, although still rendered separate from the software that they enable. So let's imagine time isn't a flat circle and travel back to 1969. In Lisa Nakamura's research titled Indigenous Circuits, Navajo, Navajo Women and the Racialization of Early Electronic Manufacture from 2014, she examines promotional materials from Fairchild Semiconductors that praise the work of Navajo women employed by their semiconductor plant in Shiprock, New Mexico. She looks at how assembly work was gendered and racialized. And here are some images from that brochure. On the left is a Navajo woman where weaving a rug, her face covered by weft threads. On the, on, in the middle is a Fairchild 9040 integrated circuit used in satellites. Its geometry superimposed against the symmetrical work of the woven rugs. Fairchild Semiconductors is a fairly historic company in computing's official history. On the right is a negative picture of its eight founders, including Gordon Moore on the very left. Moore went on to found Intel Corporation and had Moore's Law named after him during his time at Fairchild. So Nakamura shows that this labor is reframed as agents of creative cultural labor to justify the low paid and precarious nature of the work of the Navajo women. The weavers are depict, depicted to be doing a labor of love rather than alienated wage labor. Here are a few quotes from the brochure. After years of rug weaving, Indians were able to visualize complicated patterns it has been done that way for centuries. It was very natural. With this framing, the assemblers, blessed with what the brochure calls the dexterity of the Indian, were justified in receiving their low pay because they would have been doing what was natural to them anyways, weaving. Fairchild closed the plant after 1975, citing an unstable labor environment. Others attributed this to a desire to move production offshore, where wages were even lower than they were in Navajo country and workers less inclined to unionize. In producing software, this becomes a little more complicated. This presentation is appended with on the boundaries of digital labor because it is precisely at where this boundary is made between workers and software that this division is justified. In There Is No Software, Frederick Kitzler, who uh, Rob mentioned earlier, states that all changes done via software are ultimately registered as voltage changes on the CPU. So when you type on a word processor, or when you see changes coming up on your screen, those words don't appear by, by magic. 
but as material electronic changes. Software for him are just signifiers of voltage differences. When Kittler says that software doesn't exist, he means software doesn't exist independently. Software has to be translated to an everyday language that humans understand. But to translate the actions of software into things we can understand, we must create meaning. Software's meaning has become synonymous with code, a recipe. And this comes from Wendy Chun. Um, and that's what I mean by producing software. In producing software, a worker is also produced because this distinction is made. This is the assembler, this is the microprocessor, and this is the code, and this is the worker. Think about the jute workers analyzed by Lila Fernandez in producing workers, also from 1997, the same year that Frederick Hitler wrote his, wrote his paper. Fernandez took a look at why the economic crisis in the Indian jute industry in the 80s resulted in differential displacement of women from the jute labor force. In her study, she found that workers in the mill were structured in ways that not only reflected dynamics of class and gender, but actively reproduced them in the workplace. This meant spatial positioning of the workers, the recruitment practices, the union's interaction with male workers. These all reproduced ideologies within the workplace. But an active formation of these dynamics means that it is there to be challenged too. In the jute mill, a non-human agent was present. The machines were concentrated in one area, allowing workers to socialize, evading the individualizing and atomizing forces of familiar to for this production. So let's take a look at an example from a phenomenon that reached its peak a few years ago. So Google Books started out as Project Ocean back in 2007. The initial goal of the project was, according to Marissa Mayer and Larry Page, to scan every book there is in existence. At the time, they could scan one page every eight seconds. The project was touted to be expanding the frontiers of human knowledge and books in, on their own website compared themselves to an unassuming metal worker in the Rhine Valley who took the world's knowledge and made it exponentially more accessible, uh, Johannes Gutenberg. This was done, I imagine, to protect themselves from copyright critics who eventually did come at them. But note the emphasis on the culturally crucial nature of the work. Google actually contracts workers to scan these books page by page. In a piece by Andrew Norman Wilson titled Scan Ops shown on the left, the artist printed pages of Google Books missed scans that had the scanning operator's hands. They were finger cots, bright rub pink rubber wrapping their fingers, pulling the books flat under the overhead cameras. From Wilson's account, who looks on by his own white gaze, these workers were mostly black and Latino, hinting at the hiring practices of this program. These workers don't get the same benefit as other Google employees, and they were spatially and temporally separated from the rest of the campus. They worked in different buildings, arranged in rows six to eight feet apart, and worked shifts from 4 a.m. till 2.15 p.m. every day. Their gestures were described by journalist James Somers such that no machine could be as quick and gentle, that the cameras activated by the foot pedal was like playing at a strange piano. Each worker can scan about a thousand pages an hour. Most of the project's efficiency, however, is attributed to the image recognition software that enabled metadata to be extracted. So pages being dewarped, optical character recognition to be done almost instantly and in scale. What made the system so efficient is that it left so much of the work to the software, Somers writes. Wilson says that art's radical potential is in its transparency, meaning that art can make things transparent that wasn't before. But this assumes that the workers were hidden. Wilson's narrative centers his discovery as an uncovering, an enlightenment. But the, the workers appear in the patents, like the diagram on the right. They're described in the news and not as exposés. They're celebrated. These documents, creating open secrets, devalue the labor of these workers by contextualizing them separate as code, but essential to the development of human knowledge. But they are as much part of the software. So transparency isn't the opposite of obf obfuscation. Perhaps obfuscation is its own technology with no opposites. Which brings us to today with a new form of labor that is on the rise alongside the explosion of machine learning. Data taggers, for instance, annotate road footage like this picture, frame by frame, marking what is sky and what is road, what's a car and what's a tree. 
I want to focus on four interlocking factors here. Let's start with the framing. Samosource is a data provider for machine learning projects, and that's what we're talking about in this slide. They're headquartered in San Francisco, and they hire data tigers in Nairobi, Gulu, and a few places in India. From a job opening posted on their website, which I found last year, Samosaurus describes itself as a social enterprise that provides dignified internet-based work to people living in poverty. We build technology that helps leverage the brain power of the poor so they can lift themselves out of poverty by providing valuable services to companies around the world. This narrative that they are hiring people with little to no alternatives allows them to keep pay relatively low compared to the investments that they receive as a company. Compared to the $14.8 million Series A funding that they raised last year, they say with this funding, Samosource plans to upgrade the features of its platform. It also opened an AI development center in Montreal, Canada, and expanded its digital delivery center in Kampala, Uganda, to serve its corporate client base. Curiously, this work is also entangled in the increasing concern around data bias in AI. Samosource founder Lila Jana says that the companies they work with have to be really careful about bias in the algorithms or bad data. High-level conversations in technology constantly forgets that a large portion of the work done is supported by human labor. More data, better data, unbiased data, snow data without workers. Paradoxically, this empowering work heads towards the obsolescence of these very data types, and that's the paradox. The paradox of AI's last mile problem is that if it becomes sophisticated enough, that data labeling becomes superfluous to the system. That means they don't need these workers anymore. The so-called liberating work, as opposed to alienated wage labor, will disappear. I want to close with a dispatch from the pandemic. Um, Kiwi bots, delivery robots, delivering burritos on college campuses, actually runs on a semi-autonomous system with workers in Colombia, supervising three robots at a time. The workers, the company acknowledges, take over when, they, when the robots cross the street or when problems arise, like when one of these robo robots caught fire back in 2018. KiwiBot's website attributes their novelty to neural networks. Quote, thanks to our cutting edge behavioral neural network, KiwiBots are able to seamlessly mesh into the fabric of urban landscapes. A different article is accompanied with a GIF on the right showing obstacle identifying vision. In creating authoritative yet ambiguous accounts of these operators that support the digital media world, a type of discursive closure is created. An assertion of colonial truth and transparency depends on the visibility of its rules and recognition as the unmistakable referent of historical necessity. If we focus on the secrecy of these projects, we shift the focus from how meaning is produced. As technology producers, think about how much free labor we provide in doing recaptures and just existing on social media. We must understand our own meaning and technique. In its current mode, it has erased other forms of knowing, making and being. We can't stop imagining. And to understand that there's nothing without labor, it's easy to forget that just because software is cinematic, high-tech, entrepreneurial, that its mode of production doesn't stray far from how textiles and looms work. And we mustn't forget that the first algorithms were made by a machine inspired by textile looms run on paper cards. The cases that we looked at today depict practices at various points of their hype cycle. Book scanning has slowed down, data tagging is accelerating. But the fact is, as long as we delineate software as separate from these material factors that produce it, these phenomena will continue to exist. Um, that's all for today. So thank you for listening. And here's my email and Instagram. and. Uh, website, but that's that's it from me today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Olive. Um, and I'm gonna invite Rob back for our question and answer period. Um, and I want to start off with a question for both of you. If I can pull up my, so, you know, we are talking about two very different sort of subjects or laborers in these digital economies. Um. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on what might be the basis for 
excuse me, for solidarity between the subjects of your respective presentations? What do bands trying to game Spotify and, you know, workers scanning books for Google or operating robots to deliver burritos have in common? Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely a certain degree of equity that's demanded of workers on all plat or, or needed of on workers of all platforms. And I think these in both cases are attempts to kind of rectify that. Um, there's a lot of more complicated questions to ask, but I think um, there's certainly attempts to kind of do what you can with the constraints that are offered and sort of uh, within the window of participation that uh, the software as it's designed currently is allowing, um, which is kind of an interesting development of the last maybe 20 or 30 years, um, but yeah. Um, at least for me, I think the similar similarities or as you call it, the uh, what might be the subject of solidarity uh, between these two groups is that, um, is that, you know, I think the digital media world or the technology world isn't, in terms of labor, it isn't that different from um, other things out there, like we saw with the, with the textile mills. Um, and I think the important point here is that um, they, you know, as, as I mentioned that how these ideologies are reproduced within within these uh, places. Um, so, for example, in Spotify, the you know the the ambient accumulation is reproduced through that technology. Uh, though the technology might be different, I think the, the points of solidarity might be the same as with any other workers worldwide. You know, so I think that's that's what I what I see in common. Great, yeah. Um... It seems to me that there is an ever increasing realization that just by being users on the internet, we are constantly performing labor. And um, I, I don't know, I don't know if that's really inspired the level of kind of critical engagement with that question that I that many of us might have hoped for. You know, critical um, digital theorists. Uh, Rob, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this term, the specific phrase ambient accumulation, and maybe give us a better sense of why uh, ambient in particular is really key to that, to that framing for you. Yeah, I think I've just been really fascinated with the way that durational media on the internet particularly has been monetized. Um, I think the history of music has sort of shown a long downward trajectory of like sales of different kinds and Napster. And there was kind of a bottoming out of uh, how to monetize things. And, and with the rot, um, there's so much kind of financialization ongoing in the uh, advertising world um, in places like, uh, like Google AdSense and Facebook's um, sort of rise as a huge advertising entity. And one of the ways that, you know, Spotify particularly started out kind of trying a bunch of different things, but one of the ways that they found that um, really stuck was the to monetize things at the level of duration you know they could uh, sort of tell people that they were paying artists when they um, by doing it this way um, and I think uh, around the same time you know YouTube adopted something similar I think uh, I'm not sure exactly what the play count is right now or, or the uh, payment rate is now but uh, there's the kind of uh, this YouTube um, artist uh, community that regularly, it, it, it makes, um, it's a kind of financialization and uh, it borrows this logic of neoliberalism that asks uh, users to kind of advocate for themselves and sort of go out and build an audience, encourage uh, people to, you know, like, rate and subscribe and constantly uh, perform this kind of, uh, you know, asking of their fans to listen to more music. Um, participate in the, the things that were once kind of taken for granted um, as artists. And um, so that's really what it, it, it kind of comes from. I think ambience, um, just because of the durational aspect of it, I think uh, is kind of where it came from. I've noticed the kind of affinity for longer YouTube videos as YouTube has shifted, um, particularly to prioritize videos that are, you know, 10, 15 minutes in length. 
um, people are kind of having to fill time in a way that they maybe took for granted before, or um, it just this um, form of monetization prioritizes uh, duration. And I think there's a continuity um, between that and ambient music of the past um, in, in the way it manipulates time, the way it manipulates uh, the spatial aspects of listening to music. And um, like ambient computing has a rich history in urbanism. I think there's a connection between, uh, you know, the, the sort of monitoring, monitoring um, these kinds of participatory uh, technologies and then um, sort of converting that into data and data can be monetized in various ways as a sort of secondary uh, process, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it it makes me think of something that, you know, Marxists or materialists are having to grapple with when it comes to the advance of capital in the context of digital technologies, because there's a sort of spatial and temporal explosion inside with the digital that, you know, you, you mentioned this constant need for capital to expand, to find new uh, valleys of commodification and production. And so it really, you know, problematizes the, our whole model when you have a sort of almost infinitely constantly expanding source for commodification. Um, another, going back a little bit to the similarities between the groups of producers that you're both talking about, um, Volpec, the band that you mentioned, managed to profit from Spotify while basically doing no labor, right? Um, Sleepify. So I wonder where where are the the hidden laborers, or I know maybe we shouldn't call them necessarily hidden, right, Olive, because they are visible. Um, but that sort of um, I'm going to call them that anyway, because I don't know how else to describe it. Really, what's the hidden labor that enables a band to profit? You know, while their fans are sleeping. Yeah, um, I think there's a real tension between labor and value. Um, I think historically, maybe in a more orthodox Marxist approach would say that all value derives from labor, but um, in this kind of crazy mixed up financialized neoliberal world, we see that that's not always the case. Um, in some cases, you know, there are uh, people, you know, working low wage jobs uh, as data taggers, et cetera. But um, in, in some cases, there are ways to exploit that kind of predicament um, that they sort of found a loophole for in the example of Sleepify. Uh, yeah. Great, so um, I'm gonna go back to Olive real quickly. Um, <laughs> so if there are still humans running these burrito delivering robots, um, what, why, why do we need the robots? What is the, who benefits from this new model of um, the, this idea that, you know, you have, the work is still being done by human beings, right? And so what is this middleman producing for, for the companies that are going in this direction? Uh, what, what do you mean by middleman? Uh, well, I guess case? the robot would be the middleman here. Um, I mean, is it really, is it just as simple as you now have one driver who can operate three devices or is there something more complex happening there, do you think? Yes. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it, the, the question is who benefits from this model? I think um, maybe the, the, the other question we can ask is, um, how does this model appear to benefit people? Um, so it goes back to um, what Lucy Suchman calls labor-saving devices, right? Um, a lot of technology uh, were originally um, either uh, either came up as things to save time, to save uh, to to help you save time. So um, you know, from from things like automation. Um, um, spreadsheets to uh, to you know uh, to bicycles so so things you know we, we got to think of that level uh, to to scanners uh, to uh, copier machines so those things that that save time or makes things previously not possible possible through a new form of mediation so those kind of things um, I think 
uh, who they benefit is um, they are meant or they are meant to appear to save time to to not just time as a timey wimey thing but but labor to save labor uh, your own labor for example um, and the way that relates to these kiwi bots for example right uh, at least to the users the way they appear to people who use these kiwi bots is that oh they're super convenient um, a robot just pops up and i probably don't have to go interact with somebody on a bike who's been delivering all day and make small talk to them about something I don't really want to talk about. There's, there's just these, you know, robots that do not speak. Um, you know, I think uh, that, that, that serves you, right? So I think a lot, of, a lot of software originates from that desire to have things that are, that are labor saving, um, but labor saving from whom? And how is this labor appear to be safe? That's, that's where things like Kiwi bots come in, right? This is why they say that it's neural networks and that each supervisor is supervising three of them at a time, which means that if they hired one person, they could only deliver one thing at a time. Um, so I think the question there is how, how is it made to appear to be good uh, and, and, and benefit other people or society? Uh, is is through those uh, materials that we see, the promotional materials, um, the the ideas that this Kiwi bots bring, and and sort of the efficiency that, that they have. You know, um, people people make mistakes, but robots with um, with machine learning vision don't. Right, the, that's why they have all those squares on on their visions. Um, so I think I think that's the more interesting question to me is, um, you know instead of who benefits from this new model is, uh, you know, how, how do we, uh, how are we made to believe those benefits, right? So, sure. so yeah. I just want to give space in case, Rob, you have anything uh, that you wanted to add to any of that, or we do have another question coming in from the Discord, so. Um, I think there's something, a kind of fascinating sleight of hand where um, a lot of these technologies could ostensibly be, uh, you know, they could benefit people, uh, workers, you know, I think there's a rich history of technology being, you know, a, a tool um, in a way, but, but it, uh, in the kind of software economy, it's often only used to keep workers in their place, to keep low wages low, and to keep uh, managers in, removed spatially. Um, and in power uh, in ways that didn't previously exist. Um, so kind of getting back to maybe your first question earlier, uh, so with something like KiwiBots, I think um, it, it reinforces all of the kind of worst aspects of capitalism in ways that could be resisted and should be resisted, um, but currently are hard to find and hard to advocate for, mm -hmm. but yeah. So we have a question from the Discord. Um, what does the gathering of data on processes of production and consumption relate to the further commodification of activities in a global digitized market economy? How are these related to labor time and speed up? Yeah, I think in, in the case of music, um, data has been uh, a great secondary commodity in the absence of music's uh, sort of specific ontological value. Um, you can't, the classic sort of example with Spotify is that, you know, music itself might not be valuable as an individual file, but um, you can get data about, you know, currently Spotify for artists provides really rich data on where people are listening. Um, so you can theoretically, their kind of classic video promotional example is that you can book a tour through South America based on uh, knowing where all your listeners are. And, and that is kind of the secondary value of data. Um, but yeah, data ha is uh, immensely valuable in, in every industry. And I think the, like there's that, you know, classic idiom data is the new oil. I don't know how much truth there is to that exactly, but um, yeah, it becomes a kind of secondary runoff commodity that can be further financialized, I think, in many cases. Um, I think data, gathering data is probably, uh, you know, the, the biggest industry there is. 
because you need you need that data to advertise. You need that data to uh, segment users. You need that data to influence. Um, but I think in terms of you know how it relates to commodification, um, you know, I, at at this point, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, data isn't just made. Data is um, data, data wouldn't exist without without people making data, right? Because they're, they're capturing changes. They're capturing things we do. Um, they're capturing state changes. They're capturing, um, you know, our actions translated into, uh, you know, volt, voltage changes. You know, ultimately there's, there, there's that material level too, which I think is important because uh, we can't think of data as this abstract thing because it, it means a lot of different things, right? For machine learning, it means one thing. Even for machine learning, uh, when you when you when you teach machine when you do machine learning, uh, you do unsupervised learning, for example, and you do it in in a in a in sort of like an academic way. Um, you you still have to validate it, um, and you validate it by comparing it to existing uh, data sets. Uh, that, that's what you do. So even in in the promise of AI of not you know of learning without data of not not needing this commodity anymore. Once you're, once you're free from this commodity, um, the way you validate it is with things that already exist, right? It's like if we, if we rid the world of capitalism today, what, what happens to uh, the people who already have uh, capital at hand? So I think that's, you know, I think that's the multifaceted and material nature of data, uh, at least to me. For, for my own curiosity, what did the smart toothbrush do? Do you know how it uses machine learning to be a better toothbrush? No, <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't. <laughs> because I, I, you know, um, I wasn't gonna go demo it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't think you can demo toothbrushes. There are a few of them that like claim, I don't know how well they work to kind of monitor how you brush your teeth and sort of tell you data over time, like how, how you improve and like what spots you're missing, et cetera. Mm. You should probably buy floss instead of that because that's more important. <laughs> Much more important. Well, this was really great. I want to thank uh, both of our speakers, Rob Arkand and Alif Ibrahim. It was really great having you guys on today. Um, we are going to be doing uh, the next episode of Theorizing the Web Presents, which is in two weeks. The topic. Pacific. Thank you again so much to our panelists today. And thank you to uh, Museum of Living Edge for hosting Theorizing the Web Presents. Thank you. Thank you.